uh, tonight. Can we say thank you to Josh? That would be amazing. Just grateful to, uh, to have you. Uh, Josh and I went to high school together. Uh, we were in uh, college together, and we were in seminary together a little bit. And so really grateful for your life, your ministry in this city, and for your presence uh, tonight. Uh, so we need to solve an issue. We're going to have an election in the house of God tonight. Uh, and it has to do with bread. Uh, when we hear, give us today our daily bread, we might be thinking of this. Uh, you might have in your mind when you hear Jesus talking about bread, like uh, little Caesar's crazy bread is on the far left of the screen. Uh, you might also think of the, what's in the middle is the Texas Roadhouse buns. Yes. And amen to that. Uh, or the Olive Garden. So I just need to know, like, if you are Little Caesar's crazy bread person, I just need to know. Can you tell me if that's, like, what you would choose? A couple people, all right? A couple people, all right? Uh, and then let's go to Olive Garden. Let me hear the all Olive Garden people, yeah? Okay, a couple of you. And then the Texas Roadhouse. Wow! Nothing more South Dakota than Texas Roadhouse. And the cinnamon butter, too. Yeah. Uh, but in the scriptures, when we hear bread, when we think about the first century, this is more accurate of what we're talking about. So if you think about it, you know, bread, sometimes in our culture and in our diet, it's like, well, I'm kind of trying to be careful about bread right now. Uh, that was not really a thing in the ancient world. In the ancient world, what we hear of as bread was like carried around all of the time. And you would like pull it out of a bag that you had been walking with for a long time. So if you had that with you, it, there needed to be a very high salt content to this bread. Okay, So instead of it being covered in butter, it's really bathed, marinated in salt. So think more of like a really crunchy, like, granola bar kind of a thing. It would dry out your mouth. Like, not a super exciting thing to eat, but it was a nourishing thing. And so in the first century, when Jesus is saying, give us today our daily bread, this is what people had in mind. Something that nourished them. But not a food they would have been like really, really excited about. Like just think of the faces around the table when the 16-year-old at Texas Roadhouse brings the buns. And everybody's like, Phew. it's not what we're talking about. But sometimes in life, the things that nourish us aren't the things we're excited about. And so when Jesus is having this conversation with not just his disciples, but with people gathered around him, this is the picture. So one question tonight might just be like, who's Jesus talking to? Because like, he's saying like, hey, when, when you have been taught to pray, pray our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then there's a shift that happens. Give us today our daily bread. Who's Jesus talking to? Jesus is talking to people in northern Israel, a place called Galilee. And Galilee was not a really exciting place. Galilee was a rural place. It's a town in between cities, would be one way you could think of it. This is what Galilee looks like today. It's very rural. It's, it's, a, it's a farm, agricultural way of life that would take place in Galilee. It's good for you to know that the people that Jesus is talking to find themselves in a really difficult place. Now, a lot of the farmers in northern Galilee once owned land, but that land uh, was taken from them by wealthy landowners in some of the bigger cities. And so now they're what's called tenant farmers. So imagine what that experience would be like to have been working the land of a family farm, and then that land is taken by someone of great means, and now you're working that same land, but you don't own it. This is part of what was going on in 
the first century. And, and those of us in a rural setting, like in South Dakota, like we can kind of get our arms around what that would be like. Now, it's maybe a more difficult picture for us to understand uh, if we're living in Chicago or Denver or Los Angeles or something, but we kind of get that here. Um, these people were not free and they were not independent people. Uh, they were ruled by Rome. And so here's kind of a picture of Roman Empire. Uh, under Augustus. Uh, so here's where Rome is, here's Israel. And what was happening is all of the money from Israel was flowing 2,500 miles west to Rome. And you were like, well, how far is 2,500 miles? It's like Sioux Falls to Mexico City. It's a ways. Or Sioux Falls to New York City and back. So you see this dynamic this place far away from us, our resources are going to. And Israel finds itself in a really interesting place. Israel finds itself under the rule and reign of a foreign power, just like their ancestors did. Because the ancestors of this Jewish people, they, they lived in Egypt under the rule and reign of Pharaoh. And it's important today as we come into the scriptures, as we hear this teaching of Jesus, to remember that we should not be surprised when a new Pharaoh is raised up in our day. And we shouldn't be shocked by that. Because the promise of Jesus on planet Earth to his followers is not no more Pharaohs. Like, no more people who are going to rise up and to proclaim themselves king. But the promise of Jesus, the promise of God, the promise of the Holy One to his people living in his kingdom, is that you're going to have strength from on high to stand face to face with those pharaohs. So it's not that there's no more pharaohs on planet Earth. It's that you will have power to not bow to those pharaohs. So it's interesting that in a time of hunger, in a time of need, in a time of grief, Jesus is inviting these people to bring their need before him. Not to deny the fact that they have a need. Not to hold on to their need, not to clutch their need, not to bury their need, but what? But to carry their need before Jesus. Give us today our daily bread. And I just wonder if sometimes there's a connection between our disappointment in prayer and our dishonesty in prayer. Like, I wonder if... Part of why we feel at times disappointed in our prayer life is because we're not being honest with God about what our needs actually are, and we're maybe not even being honest with ourselves about what our needs actually are. I mean, I'll just speak for myself. The times when I have been disappointed in my life with God in prayer is the times I'm not being honest about what's really in here, about the stuff that I'm anxious about, about the stuff that I'm worrying about about the stuff that keeps me up at night. And I kind of feel like, God, where are you in all of this? And I wonder if he's like, Dave, where are you in all of this? And so I wonder if tonight is a little bit of an invitation to be honest with God about what's in here. To not deny it, to not hide it, to, to not pretend like we don't have needs. We live in a space, we live in a day, we live in a time when many of us have a doctoral degree in meeting our needs. And then maybe we find ourselves at a spot like, well, I can meet all of these needs except this one, so here, now I'll call upon God to meet my needs. But the rhythm of daily bread is that we would have daily needs that God the Father would be pleased in and through the power of the Holy Spirit to meet. And so tonight's just a simple question, what do you need? What'd you walk into this place with tonight? What's the anxiety? What's the worry? What's the fear? I don't know. What was the argument on the way here? 
what's going on in your soul. You know, what's the thing that disrupts your sleep? What's the thing that causes you to pop out of bed at one in the morning? What's the thing that you're waking up with? What's the thing that you're going to bed with? What's the thing that you're living with throughout the day? What do you need? It could also be our experience, you know, that some kind of hospital system is kind of ruling our schedule. Some people find themselves in that place in life where there's some kind of diagnosis or some kind of hardship and we're just kind of bouncing from this appointment to this appointment to this appointment to the, give us today our daily bread. Like, what do you need when you find yourself in that place? Or we could talk about this one. There's some kind of relational tension in your life. I know, so weird. Just think about what that would be like for a minute. Some kind of brokenness. Like some kind of hardship relationally in your life. Maybe it's somebody that you're working with, somebody in your family. You happen to live at the same address, and there's just, there's a rub going on. There's a broken, like, what do you need? Like, are we being honest about that? Are we denying it? Are we pushing it down? Are we trying to meet it for ourselves? We could talk about a classroom. Like, maybe the classroom's chaotic. Maybe that's just part of your experience. Maybe you are an adult and you feel like the classroom's chaotic. Maybe you're a kid and you feel like the class, like what do you need? If Jesus was sitting knee to knee with you, I think he would just want to look at you in the eye and just ask you like, what do you need? We've got moments in the scriptures when Jesus encounters a person and he just says, what would you like me to do for you? And it happens to be a guy who couldn't see and he just says, I want to see you. What do you want me to do for you? So one side of it is what do you need? But the other side of it is what needs do you see? Because God is not this like divine server that just like comes out from the double doors and he's like, right? He's got an apron. For some reason, I don't know why I'm holding it like this. I just imagine <laughs> that if God was a cosmic server, he would hold it like this and not like this, like a normal person. God's an overachiever, I guess. Uh, God's also not this divine, this cosmic vending machine, and we just hit G4, and here comes... That's not what we're talking... But sometimes I fear we overreact to not wanting to communicate that God is like that. And so the overreaction is we pretend like we don't have needs. But there's the other side, not just what needs do you have, but what needs do you see? Like when you open your eyes in the world, give us today our daily bread. Yeah. Like what needs do you see in the world? Like when you walk out of here and you get in your car and you drive to that address and you wake up tomorrow and you go about your day as you think about the next 24 hours, what needs do you see? Give us today our daily bread. You know what I think we miss in this prayer? I think we miss the grammar. Give us today our daily bread. The prayer's not, God, give me today my daily bread. All the teachers in the house are like, oh, the grammar, I love it. It's grammar and sermon. Give us today our daily. This is a prayer that is designed to be prayed not in isolation, but in community. This is a prayer that is to be prayed with and for the person sitting next to you. It's designed to be prayed for the person who's standing before you with a microphone on his face. It's designed to be prayed in community. God, would you provide for her? God, would you show up for him? God, would you fill the hospital with your Holy Spirit? God, would you break into that classroom in a powerful way? God, would you fill the hallways of that place? God, would your spirit rain down in our home? God, we need you. Give us today our daily bread. Um, Jesus' words today give us today our daily bread, would have 
taken the Jews who were gathered around Jesus back to a significant moment in their history. I don't know if you've had this experience of like being at a wedding dance and then there's a song, like you're sitting at your table enjoying whatever it is you're enjoying and then the DJ gets on the mic and says something like, hey, we're gonna switch it up a little bit and then the song that it gets switched up to, you have a strong memory to. Like maybe it's Whitney Houston, ooh, I wanna dance with somebody. I don't know, maybe that's, that's what it is or uh, fishing in the dark, that's a common wedding song. Or maybe it's something else and you're like, oh, I can't sit here, I gotta go over there. Even though it's gonna be awkward for me and my family and everybody, I have a strong memory attached to this song. When Jesus says to the people gathered around him, give us today our daily bread, I want you to know that that sentence is taking the Jewish people back to Exodus chapter 16. What's happening in Exodus chapter 16 is that the people of God are in the wilderness and they're hungry and they don't have a source of food. And so God says, I have an idea. I'm going to show my love and my power and my grace and my provision through this bread-like substance that's going to be on the ground. And every day when my people wake up, there's going to be food. It's not going to be eggs benedict or frosted flakes or anything like that. But it's going to be what's called manna. Manna in the original language is this word, this term uh, that means what is it? And the idea is not that there's like loaves of bread falling from the sky. I think when I was a kid, I like did a children's ministry Sunday school lesson one time. And it had like a bunch of loaves on the ground and I had to color them in. And I just remember thinking, I just don't understand the physics of this. Like, wouldn't have some people died if the bread hit them in the face? Like, I just, that was where my brain thought about that. We don't actually know how this actually worked. Our best guess is there's this, like, bread-like flakes would have, like, been on the ground, and you would have been able each day to kind of collect those things, and it was a food source. Again, not a super exciting thing to eat, but a very nourishing thing to eat. But there were some instructions that came with the gift. There was instructions that came with the provision. There's really two major instructions. Instruction number one was don't grab more than you needed for the day. So the idea wasn't just to take all of the manna and save it for tomorrow, save it for down the road, save it for Daryl who overslept. That's not the idea at all. Just take what you need for today Except on Friday, you're supposed to take for the Sabbath. Because on the Sabbath, things rested. And so even Jesus, there's Good Friday and there's Easter Sunday. And what's happening on Saturday is that the bread of life is resting in the tomb. And so that idea is don't collect manna on the Sabbath. Because even the Son of God is resting in death on the Sabbath, but he's going to be raised to life on Easter Sunday. And so when Jesus says, give us today our daily bread, that's what they were taken back to. And so with all of this, like, what is Jesus inviting us to consider? I think one of the things that Jesus is inviting us to consider is daily faithfulness. Like, give us today our daily Like, not bread for tomorrow, not bread for next week, not bread for next year, but daily. And I think if Jesus had a critique of us, I wonder if one of his critiques might be like, you really struggle with that daily thing. That our minds so easily jump to tomorrow and down the road and what's next. And we find ourselves not thinking about today in this moment. But we can live with this fear that maybe this thing that we have is going to run out, so i got to make sure I can do everything that I can so that that doesn't happen. Jesus says, I have come to be daily bread. That's why I've come. I've come to be daily bread for the world. I've come to illustrate both what faithfulness looks like on planet Earth, and what reliance looks like on planet Earth. So even we see this in the Son of God, in Jesus. We see him 
showing up faithfully day after day after day in his relationship with God. And we also see him leaning on God. We see him relying. We see him getting away and spending time with the Father. Because why? Because of daily bread. Because it's about daily faithfulness. And so I just think that, that Jesus would say to us today, like, I love that you forgave him yesterday. I love that. I love that you extended grace last Tuesday when that person cut you off pulling into the Chick-fil-A parking lot. Like, I love, there was no extra fingers in that moment. Like, I love that. I love that you trusted me during a really tough time in 2020. I love that you, you did that. But I want to talk to you about daily faithfulness. I want to talk to you about like, what it looks like today to trust me. Like, I love that you trusted me in the past. But I would like to talk with you about what it looks like for you to trust me today, now, in this moment. Give us today our daily bread. I think Jesus would also say to us, have you ever been in the bread aisle? Got lots of bread in the bread aisle. There's bread for breakfast in the bread aisle. There's bread for lunch in the bread aisle. Bread for supper in the bread aisle. Bread for dessert in the bread aisle. There's bread from Europe in the bread aisle. There's bread from the Middle East in the bread aisle. There's bread from Lamar's, Iowa in the bread aisle. From all over the place. And Jesus would say, there's lots of bread that you can seek to satisfy yourself with. There's lots of bread that you could fill your life with. But it's not the bread of life. So if he would walk with me down the bread aisle, he might find himself saying, you might be tempted to fill your life with the bread of achievement. And live a life that's all about whatever the next thing is. The next dollar. The next award. The next moment of recognition. And you can build a life where you are waking up in the morning and you're collecting that bread of achievement. And I wonder if Jesus would be here with us, sitting knee to knee with us, and if he would just, in all of the grace and kindness and wisdom that he has within himself, would just look at us in the eye and say, when is it going to be enough? When is the bread of achievement going to be enough? If he was walking with us down the bread aisle, he might want to talk to us about the bread of status. Like, when will you reach a point in your life when you will feel good about where you are? Uh, what's interesting about status is that when we are seeking some kind of status and recognition in the world, it's interesting that we're allowing someone to name us who had no part in creating us. We're asking to be named by someone that didn't create us. Named worthy, named beautiful, named successful, named good. And we're trying to earn something that we've already been given. It just turns out that if we ask Jesus, we can't actually earn the identity of son. We actually can't earn the identity of daughter. That's something that's only given. But if we would ask Jesus, I wonder if his experience of us is that in the hustle, we try to fill our lives and we try to earn what he's already given us. If he would walk with us down the bread aisle, and yes, this is the last one, I wonder if he would want to talk to us about the bread of validation. If we're waiting for somebody to validate our existence as a person, to tell us that we're enough. To tell us that we're loved. Tell us that we matter. And one of my great concerns, besides my mic getting caught on my t-shirt, is 
for followers of Jesus to be so focused on the next thing that Jesus wants to say that we don't live into the words he's already spoken over us. So we can be, find ourselves in a place where we're very focused on the next thing Jesus wants to say, the wisdom that he wants to depart in our life. When Jesus is like, hey, like the stuff I've talked with you about, like I just want you to accept that. I want you to wrap your arms around that. Like it's interesting in the book of John, there's a group of people who are gathered around Jesus and they're asking, like, what are you asking of us? What do you want us to do? And Jesus simply says, believe. What is the work of God? To believe in the one who he has sent. And part of believing in the one who he has sent is believing the words that the one who has been sent by God has spoken in and over your life. So the bread aisle. Maybe the next time you're in the bread aisle, we might think about croissants and bagels and slices of 100% wheat toast differently. The challenge of Jesus is to receive the daily bread that he desires to give us and to not pursue the bread of validation, the bread of status, or the bread of achievement. I'm going to invite Josh um, back up for us and we've got a couple tables with pictures of bread. I wish you could have seen the dear woman at Walgreens who printed them for me (laughs) when I went in there this morning to pick them up. And I said, hey, I've got some pictures to pick up. She's like, oh, that's great. What's the last name? Total the last name. She goes, oh, the bread? (laughs) Like, yes. The 200 pictures of bread. I just really love bread. Um, Here's the invitation tonight. As Josh is going to play a little bit, and um, you would come, and you would pick two pictures. Uh, One picture is your confession of your great need for God's provision in your life. So an area of anxiety, an area of fear, an area of great need. And so hopefully one of those pictures to you speaks to that. And yes, it's bread, so you've got to kind of use your imagination. Uh, But then I want you to pick up another piece, another picture that illustrates the needs you see in the world. Because give us today our daily bread is what needs we have, but the needs that we see. And my prayer is not that they stay on the back tables after appetizer time, but that they would go with you and they would at least make it to the car. That'd be amazing. But even more than that, my hope beyond making it to the car is that they would make it home with you and you would place it somewhere. And so that this week, when you're praying, give us today our daily bread, you'll consider your own needs but you also consider the needs that you see that might prompt us to be maybe a little bit more honest about what's in here before God. I'm going to pray for us, and then Josh is going to play, and I invite you to come forward, and then I'll, I'll close us up. Jesus, we are grateful tonight for your presence. We're thankful for your words spoken to us and over us. Words of life, and words of hope, words of blessing, and words of challenge when we need it. And God, I pray that we would see you as the one who provides daily bread for us. We would see you as the one who provides daily encouragement, and daily strength, daily perspective, daily conviction, and daily faith. And that your spirit would prompt us to pray for the needs that we see in the world. Because God, we know that one of the ways you desire to communicate your care to the world is through your kids. So as your sons and as your daughters, would you prompt us to not just care deeply about the needs of the world, 
but to step in to the needs of the world. Doing what we can while we ask you to do what alone you can do. God, thank you for these people gathered in this place today. I thank you for their lives. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for the good work you are doing in and through them. God, as we prepare to consider what daily bread might look like in our life as followers of Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us as we step into this space together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, precious Lord, none on the earth, heaven above, that I have found you. Jesus, Jesus, 